All right, so welcome to the uh, one of the new Forge webinars. Um, today we are going to be speaking um, to three very important comrades and friends um, connected to the Black Lives Matter conversation that is happening in the United States and how it has sparked protests and um, different discussions connected to police brutality um, in and around the globe. Um, we know that these are historical moments of repression, but also historical moments of resistance to systemic racism, racialized capitalism, and white supremacy and police brutality. It's important for us to consolidate uh, popular narratives and make sense of the counter narratives of which of, of those who are constantly in struggle. Uh, to help us to do that today, we have uh, Claudia de la Cruz. Um, Claudia was born in the South Bronx to immigrant parents from the Dom Dominican Republic. She is a popular educator, communi community organizer, organizer and theologian. In her role as executive director at the People's Forum, Claudia is committed to contribute her experience and skills in the creation of cultural education spaces with organizers, educators and cultural workers and artists to continue producing, promoting, uplifting the cultural traditions that nourish and strengthen our communities and our struggles towards social justice. For over 20 years, she has been committed to movement building and actively participated in collective grassroots spaces, particularly in the communities of Washington Heights and the South Bronx. Thanks for being here today, Claudia. Thank you. We also have Professor Lewis Gordon, who is an Afro-Jewish philosopher, political thinker, educator and musician who teaches in the Department of Philosophy with affiliations in Judaic studies, Caribbean and Latin X studies, Asian and Asian America studies, women, gender and sexuality studies and global affairs at Yukon stores in the United States. He is also the author of many books including Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, Fanon and the Crisis of the European Man, Her Majesty's Other Children, Existentia Africana, Disciplinary Decadence, and an Introduction to Africana Philosophy, as well as what Benon said. He is also the Honorary President of the Global Center for Advanced Studies and former President of the Caribbean Philosophical Association. Thank you for being with us today, Louis. And then finally, we have Khadija Bauer, who is a researcher at the Social Justice Coalition, a grassroots organization that mobilizes to call for safety, healthy, and dignified communities in Kailija and other informal settlements across the country. She completed her undergraduate degree in BA Law at the University of Stellenbosch. She completed her philosophy honors with a special focus on feminist theory and the law, um, also at Stellenbosch University. She's, a current, she's currently a master's candidate that is focusing on policing and sexual violence in South Africa and, and is an opinion, a frequent opinion writer at the Daily Maverick Voices 360 and other local publications in the country. My name is Fizul Shem Tonti. I am from The Forge. And so maybe to kind of um, open this discussion, I would like to um, ask about some of your reflections on how the corporate media characterize the protest actions of black and brown people in the United States as a, a, along with um, in South Africa. So what we often see is how the state and the corporate media delegitimize protesters creating narratives of criminality to justify their brutality or other narratives around dehumanization of black and brown bodies. Um, and so we know that there's always strong dimensions of class and race that are connected to um, the ways in which we uh, are seeing people being policed across the globe. And we're just wondering if we could open up with you, Professor Lewis Gordon, um, about some of your reflections on this. Well, well, the first thing, well, first of all, thanks, Fez, again, and to everybody for permitting me to participate in this forum. The first thing uh, I would like to say is we should use the term police violence because uh, the thing about brutality in, in, is that it's linked to the idea of force and the notion of excessive force. But if we don't question the use of force to begin with, we don't realize that if it's illegitimate, 
it's already in the ambit of violence. So the thing about it is that the police, in order to draw upon their sense of legitimacy, they, at that moment, have a structure in which they could go, they could do anything, and it would not appear illegitimate if we don't call it violence. And the reason I say this is, I bring this up, is because when the uh, uprisings, the insurrections began, the corporate media, and also the public supported media, they were at first using the language of brutality and force. However, many of us who are engaged in social media began to offer a critique through Twitter and other um, platforms that began to clarify the language. And I've noticed increasingly, even with the corporate media, except for, of course, the blatantly right-wing ones like Fox News, they're using the words police violence. And I think this is really crucial, mainly because one of the presumptions of the ruling elites is that they can control the narrative. They imagine that those of us, uh, most people are engaged in social media, and particularly in this case, it's the young people. They see a lot of young people as drones whom they could miss, they could manipulate with misinformation and disinformation. But the quarantine situation, the COVID-19 situation, actually created uh, an opportunity to transform using those resources from what people, the older generations would imagine as a kind of social video gaming into the actual situation of sociality because physical distancing, which is the correct word for what the quarantining is, does not have to entail social distancing. And many began to use these resources for social connectedness, which is why a lot of the young people who are out on the streets are not simply enraged, but they're also socially connected. And this is crucial mainly because the media, uh, uh, the, the, the more established forms of media are playing catch up. They realize that they're actually uh, not ahead of a phenomenon. They're not even closely behind it. They're trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And this is very crucial because it means that there's a form of creative synergy of young people from of many ages, including all the way through to little children, who are part of a participatory discourse of changing a lot of these, these the way these are talked about. I have a lot more to say on it, but I would like to hear from uh, the fellow panelists and come in later. Thank you so much, Louis. Um, Claudia, in terms of your experiences as an organizer, what are some of your reflections connected to this question? I mean, I think it's important to know the historic role of the corporate media in relationship to the state. I, I think I agree with Professor Gordon in the sense of um, calling it violence. I think, it, you know, the police is one of the many mechanisms that is utilized from the state to be able to, to enforce uh, violence and in some ways even shape consent um, and uh, shape uh, popular opinion, right? And so the corporate media, uh, that's, that's, the, that's exactly the terrain they come in to be able to shape the popular opinion and kind of um, drive the discourse that the state wants to then justify police violence. Um, it's important to raise, you know, that what's happening across the United States is the politicization and the radicalization of a lot of the young people and folks that are out in the street protesting, precisely because they're able to experience firsthand what corporate media is doing. These are folks that are going into the streets and are organizing and are chanting um, and are not outside agitators. These folks are, are in their communities uh, doing their rightful duty um, of expressing their righteous anger. And, you know, then they come home and they hear the narrative of the corporate media calling on, you know, outside agitators saying that the, the, the violence is being provoked um, by, by people who are protesting. And so they are, they are immediately confronted with a narrative that is completely uh, 
a deviation from their experience. And, and that process is a process of radicalization that is happening with a lot of the folks. And so that's why we see that in Atlanta, one of the first uh, protests in solidarity with the Floyd family, but also, you know, was calling out CNN for the way in which they were covering um, the, the protest. And so, you know, I think that there's, there's been a process um, that it's not new. It's, you know, it's, it's become um, more deep with, with what happened with George Floyd, because we need to understand that's been, I mean, it's not about the nine minutes that uh, Officer Chauvin was on his neck is about the 400 years of oppression and exploitation, and that needs to be clear. You know, I think people are starting to make connections um, on how the state works and how it's continued to exploit and oppress um, brown and black bodies. And I should always also say the working class in general, right? I think um, including whites. And so folks are coming to that realization and that's the threat. That's the big threat in the United States. When people realize just how the political, um, military, um, ideological forces work in alliance to, to oppress. I think it's important to also bring forth um, to this discussion in relationship to the use of social media, um, that it's had a huge impact in, in uprisings. Uh, we could remember, you know, Ferguson and the way in which young people in Ferguson were communicating with Palestinians, you know, to be able to learn tactics of defense uh, of the people. Um, right now, there, there's been um, that type of socializing um, security measures that are not only physical, but are also digital, you know, the way in which young people are putting out, if you are going to come out to protest, cover your face. And they're not only talking about COVID-19, right? They're talking about digital surveillance and the way in which the state has utilized social media platforms to identify, you know, folks that are involved in struggle. We, we need to also acknowledge, you know, people haven't mentioned how, um, the George Floyd story came to be. It was a 17 year old young woman uh, named Darnella Frazier who was walking around and who obviously has been shaped, you know, shaped by the Black Lives Matter movement, by the, um, um, the folks uh, that have been organizing around different things probably in Minnesota, probably nationwide. We have to also acknowledge that there, ha that, that there has been much more of a, uh, to articulate, you know, what oppression, what exploitation looks like from movements to end gentrification, to movements to demilitarize the police, to movements to, you know, against uh, transportation hikes, all these things play into the shaping of the consciousness of a lot of these young people that are out in the streets. And this young woman who's 17 took out her camera and recorded and it went viral, you know, and it was one of many other um, assassinations, murders that have taken place during a moment of crisis, which is also important to state. Like, this is not just happening in a vacuum. This is not an isolated case. It's historical, it's systematic. And it happens in a, in a context of economic crisis um, that is not only national, it's global, right? And so... George Floyd was one of 44.7 million people who have lost their jobs in the last three months, you know, and um, he was judged and executed because there was a sense of a crime of poverty being made. So the aspect of class and race needs to be brought to the forefront as well, you know, and, and what the corporate media has done is follow suit from the state. So this whole labeling of, of uh, mobilizers and organizers as Antifa groups, right? Um, what does that mean? That if you're anti-fascist, then you're a terrorist? You know, that's huge. You know, that's saying that most people who are in, engaged in struggle and are obviously against the politics of the state are at threat to be persecuted. This is something that happened during the 60s and 70s with the Black Panther Party, with the Young Lord Party, you know, and so it, it's historical, it's systematic, and the patterns that are being utilized are, are incredible. However, you know, the context that we're experiencing right now is unprecedented 
in in ways that we need to also evaluate the consciousness of people is is in a different place and i think you know that's the that's the huge threat um for for the u.s state and i'll leave it there and you know just pass the mic Sure. Um, you know, Khadija, thank you very much, Claudia, for that. Um, you know, what we've also seen is that interventions that um, Claudia was speaking about and, and kind of democratizing the voices that are able to um, reach the media um, have also been very useful in us thinking through the conversation around Colin Scorza um, and our own um, folks that have been brutalized by the police um, during this moment. Um, what are, are your kind of reflections? You've really been um, connected to different media houses at the moment in trying to explain the situation um, connected to police brutality. What are your thoughts about this at the moment? Um, so I think it's also, um, firstly, thank you for having me, but I think what Claudia and Lewis have pointed out is extremely important that, you know, it's not an incident or an occurrence um, with George Floyd or Colin Scorza that is happening in the now. It is, you know, the decades and the centuries that happened before this that are extremely important to the context, right? So um, in the case of South Africa, you know, after 1994, we really thought that given the role that the security service played in the, um, as an instrument for the apartheid government to, you know, um, instruct its oppression, we really thought that after 1995, we could, you know, go on this journey with security services in order to, you know, um, reconstruct its legitimacy. Um, I, I really do think, you know, after 1995, 1994, there was this like euphoria of like, oh, now we can trust the police, right? Because prior to this, you know, um, black colored and Indian people in South Africa could never, you know, trust the police, right? So we were never citizens, um, we didn't have citizenship to begin with, right? Um, so the police never worked in our favor. And so after 1994, we really thought that we were going to embark on this journey where um, we now have citizenship, we now have socioeconomic to a certain degree and political rights, especially, um, that that would change. But as we see more and more and more, I mean, we've had notorious examples of um, how the opposite has been true. And in relation to the media, especially in South Africa, you know, Claudia spoke about how this violence is on the back of other forms of violence, so like gentrification. Um, and in South Africa, that's especially important. You know, you have the gentrification um, that's happening in Cape Town right now. You see mass evictions. You know, it's raining today in Cape Town. And the city of Cape Town is evicting people while their homes are being flooded, right? So the violence that we see um, and the violence that we see on the part of the state is it is really in a it's in a, a number of ways it's in a multitude of ways um, so when we so then when we talk about what's happening in the media it really is the media sort of painting the narrative and contributing to the narrative of anti poorness and anti blackness in south africa um, but it, it is you know really sad to see that as a you know, in South Africa, we have this term for people that was that were born in 1994, this Rainbow Nation, born free-esque um, group of people. It's for the 25 and 26-year-olds, it's very damning to see, um, you know, this crisis of legitimacy that we sit with. You know, women are afraid to go to the police even after they've been sexually assaulted. Um, people are afraid to call the police when they are... Um, a victim of an illegal eviction because they're scared that the police are going to inflict even more violence on them. Um, so that is really the crisis that we're sitting with right now in terms of, you know, state actors imparting and inflicting all of this violence in a, in a multitude of ways and the media contributing to that. I think also what we're realizing is that there's a way in which um, we are we are fighting an ideological um, battle here um, that has construed and created folks other, um, has made people less than and made people's lives um, to be less legitimate in the face of um, what we understand as, um, you know, the public, the, the main publics. And we know that there are different kinds of publics and we see that the, the lives of black um, and brown people across the globe aren't necessarily given that um, space to um, continuously commit to their humanity. 
And I'm, I'm just interested in how we think we can figure out different modes of public safety um, and um, what it might look like from voices from below to think through this, 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 this kind of conception of, of public safety. We've heard this term being used quite a lot in conversations in the United States. If you have any reflections on that, Claudia. I mean, I think that's a really good question. Um, I have a comrade that says that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, and I think he's correct. I think um, our understanding or our radical imagination has been somewhat stagnated by, you know, hundreds of years of, of shaping and molding what workers are and how they act and how they relate to the world and how the world relates to us uh, as well. And so, you know, we often think about community policing, right, or community control, but um, there are elements, you know, because the devil's in the details, that in some ways, uh, sometimes you might think, you know, are, are not necessarily new, but something like the replication of other models that are also in somewhat, um, in some way, um, judging and executing in some sort of type of punishment as well. So, so they don't necessarily distance themselves practically from, um, from the logic of capitalism. And I think, you know, um, right now there's a lot of, a lot of demand is centered around uh, defunding the police and defunding the militarization of policing. Um, which is a start, right? But I think obviously the goal, the overall goal should be the abolishment of the state, <laughs> um, which is huge. It's huge because we're talking about also the abolishment of the economic, um, the economic system. And, you know, we've been socialized to think about reform as the end of, of our struggle. We've been socialized to think about electoral politics as the end of our politics, right? And so it'll take uh, a lot of work for us to get to a space where we understand that revolutionary processes have stages and that demanding for the defunding of police is, is one, state, one stage, one step, but it's not the end all, you know? Um, and reimagining what uh, community uh, control of not only police, but, but the state in general, like we need to be able to learn from folks that actually have done it. And one of the biggest things with corporate media and the socialization in this country is that we're taught that anything that is outside of the capitalist logic is wrong. So we can't look to Cuba. We can't look to Venezuela. We can't look to China, right, as models, because we've taught to, we are taught to hate um, without knowing the, the different ways in which folks are enforcing community um, control from a very grassroots level to a very, like, national level. Um, and so it'll take a process of deconstructing and learning uh, new ways of, of, of exchanging or relating. Um, and, you know, the hope is that we will get there. But again, it has to do with us understanding the state as an apparatus and understanding how it works in order for us to be able to learn how to deconstruct it. One of the things that we uh, often raise is on Sue's um, art of war as a quote you know your enemy and know yourself we need to know how the enemy operates and we need to know what our our models and our logics are in opposition to the model of of the capitalist system which is ultimately one that is upheld by white supremacy by patriarchy by xenophobia you know by hate and so how how do we create systems and structures um that have the defense of life and the defense of the planet at the center um, that's a huge question, and I don't think one person or one organization can actually answer it. I think that there needs to be more articulation, not only across the country, but across the world around models that are sustainable and that are for life and, and that are actually efficient in the way in which they work. And I think we have a lot to learn from, our, from international uh, processes, um, but unfortunately, we're, we're not there yet. Sure. Um, and, and Lewis, maybe to kind of bring you in um, at that last thought that Claudia had, how do we leverage different kinds of um, knowledges and different kinds of movement um, thinking and strategies to make sense of how to intervene and create new kind of spaces within this moment where we are in fact physically distanced but need to be more socially connected? Well, the first thing that we should do is for many of us who are 
involved in the the process of knowledge and organization communication and activism we need also to disentangle the idea that the concepts with which we work are fundamentally european concepts there are a lot of a lot of times for instance even when we talk about the state we don't realize we're talking about a euro modern state and it's as if it's as if a lot of the concepts we deal with were brought willy-nilly out of um, euro modernity and capitalism if we bring it together to look at something like the South African context, as an example, we would see that, for instance, some of Biko's analyses are really on target here because what Biko pointed out was that uh, fundamentally an, uh, an anti-black racist state is, is inevitably compelled to engage in a war against politics and democracy. It's ultimately got, takes the naked form of a war against the people. And this is a very crucial element because you see the people are the ultimate source of legitimacy in a society. And if we look carefully at what's going on right now, what we begin to see is that the naked face of violence against the people, that face takes the form of the police. We see uh, right now the contradictions of the argument that they are to protect us when we know, in fact, that 90% of police activity have nothing to do with public safety or protecting the people. In fact, 90% of the time, it's bureaucratic. And in fact, many communities, and it was striking what many of you say, because I, was, I know this, the, first, the last thing you want to do as a person of color is call the police. And the reason for this is because you know you're bringing violence into your home. It'll be, either, the violence that they would unleash on you would, could result in death, versus even if you are in an abusive situation to begin with. So the very fact that that's what the police represent already says much. But the thing we should bear in mind, and it struck me from what uh, Katia and what from Claudia was saying in the very beginning, is we're also living in the convergence of multiple pandemics. And these are pandemics inaugurated over the past 500 years from the birth of colonialism, it's marriage with capitalism, the formation through a particular form of, frankly, uh, Christian consciousness that became consciousness of whiteness in the flesh. And a lot of these things, as they converge, have taken the form about who belongs, uh, in, who has the right to life and who does not. And if we look at the way these, these, pan these pandemics unfold, they unfold in a form of genocide in terms of making more efficient the mechanisms of spreading disease. If we look at what was done to the indigenous populations of the Americas, or Abayayala is the actual right word, all the way through the way those were unleashed on the African continent and particularly South Asia, we can see the connection between those mechanisms and what we're experiencing right now in COVID-19 in terms of how it functions in terms of pandemics. But we should bear in mind that we're dealing also with a, um, something that Claudio is bringing up, which is we're dealing with an epic conflict over two ideas of, global, uh, of globalism. One idea of globalism, and this is why it's linked to the question of capitalism and that what we started with when you said specifically corporate media. One idea of globalism is the radicalization of privatization. And the radicalization of privatization means that mobility, models of freedom, models of liberty are in the hands of the few who have access to capital. And so, for instance, one of the things that's not paid attention to in terms of the spread of the novel coronavirus and the situation with COVID-19 is that it, was, it has been primarily spread across the planet by global elites. We have to understand this. People who are stratified, immobilized, rural, don't have access to spreading this. The reason it was able to travel that fast is because of that. Second, the mechanisms they set up are mechanisms of disempowerment. And disemp the thing about democracy is democracy requires the distribution of power across people in a society, which means democracy requires a radicalization of publicity, the public knowledge. So we see on the one hand a disenfranchising, disenfranchising uh, a disempowering logic, which is, which, is, which is part of the critique that Claudia was making. But we also understand that those of us who are involved in the struggle are not simply reactionary. It's not simply what we want to get rid of, it's what we're fighting for. 
And if we think about what we're fighting for, we're fighting for the globalization of public access to the institutions through which people are able to flourish as human beings. And if we understand that, what comes along with those are everything from access to healthcare to the transformation of how we understand even notions of employment. The fundamental contradiction of, of, of what is handed to us in a privatization model is on the one hand, a, a, a liberal premise, which is we're, we're informed, we're all born with a right to life, right? You hear that everywhere. But then after you're born, you're told, now you got to earn a living. And those are contradictory because the idea to say that you have a right to life, but now you have to go through a process that gives you the right to keep living. That is problematic, especially in a world of surplus, surplus resources, surplus food, surplus technology, surplus, 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 surplus. But then in order to create scarcity, something is introduced which is entirely false. This is what is contradictory with the premise that we have a right to life. What's, what's, what's contradictory is now the notion of surplus people. So what we begin to understand is that what, what was witnessed not only in terms of George Floyd, but what, what was, has been witnessed in quarantine, and by, night, by quarantine here, I don't only mean quarantine in your home. What I mean is that the mechanisms, the logic of the kind of media resources we're talking about uh, were designed to quarantine the appearance of violence onto people who have been suffering from these pandemics from the, for the past 500 years. And what had happened was that particular murder was not quarantined. And because that murder was not quarantined, it brought out the fundamental issue, which I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to close with right now, which is that if we bring it, if we, if, if we examine what we're talking about, we're talking about a minimum of three crises of legitimacy in our age. The first crisis we already talked about when I said surplus people is the crisis of humanity. The idea, in other words, that there are people, human beings, who are dehumanized. The next one's a crisis of freedom and, and liberty and liberation. And that is the, fundamentally the crisis of democracy. The idea that people can go out there and actually connect and socialize to build meaning. But the third, and this is the one we're seeing that's connected to the state, and not only the state, the mechanisms of producing knowledge, to a variety of other, of other of other institutions, and that is the crisis of justification. There's no way witnessing what we're witnessing, not only in the United States, but in Brazil, in South Africa, in India, all over the globe, there's no way right now to, 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 um, artic to defend or to accept the idea of the justification of the police as the, not only the representation of the state, but a state that has to use such, a, such, such um, resources of violence is intrinsically illegitimate, you see? Because the state is supposed to be for the people, not against the people. And so what we're witnessing is the erosion of legitimacy of the justificatory practices of the state. Um, that's very useful also when we think about the South African context in which um, I, I was just reading a viewfinder report um, which connected 42,365 cases against the police, which the IPED, which is a, a, a body that should actually be investigating the police in and of themselves, is not necessarily doing the kind of work that they're meant to be doing. What we're seeing is that more egregious harm is being made, particularly black and poor South Africans have no kind of recourse um, we're seeing in this moment. And that is also connected to the issue of um, the, the state and, and not having necessary measures to deal with um, a just society. I'm just curious as to your thoughts on this, Khadija Bawa, about what we think through um, creating reforms and accountability measures that aren't just, um, you know, not necessarily dealing with the, the, the contemporary moments of uh, delegitimizing black life at the moment. Um, so I think it's really interesting, right? So last year was the five-year anniversary of the release of the report of the Kailicha Commission of Inquiry. 
So the Kailicha Commission of Inquiry was a very monumental inquiry that was set up um, in uh, around about officially started in 2014, but um, was you know uh, trying to, um, trying to set up in 2012. But basically, this Commission of Inquiry looked at the failure or the breakdown of trust between the community of Kailicha, which, which is just under a million residents and um, the police um, that service the area of Kailicha. So, you know, if we take um, the questions out of, if we take out of the conversation police violence, and we're just talking about police effectiveness in South Africa, there is a crisis already. You, you know, the Kailicha Commission of Inquiry had a total of 20 recommendations, and these recommendations were profound, honestly. It spoke to every single crisis in policing that you could think of that plagues informality in South Africa. It spoke about public lighting. It spoke about um, access to sanitation. It spoke about um, where the detectives are, how they should be patrolling. It really was. These recommendations were a step-by-step -step guide on how to reform policing in South Africa. But like I said, last year marked the five-year anniversary of the re release of this report. And I promise you, not one of these recommendations has been taken up by local, provincial, or national government. The SJC uh, last year, um, no, in 2018, had to take the Minister of Police to court. And basically, our entire court case was around the redistribution of police re uh, resources so that areas such as Camps Bay and Seapoint with minimal rates of murder um, could have, because the current standing is still on the basis and the standards of apartheid, so even though these policing and uh, these uh, police precincts have less murder rates, they have much higher number of detectives and police officers versus places like Nyanga, Mitchell's Plain, um, and Kalicha, right, which have higher numbers of murder rates but have extremely low numbers of police officers and detectives, right? So even if we're not talking about police violence, even if we're talking about police efficiency in South Africa, it's in an abysmal state of crisis. So how can a commission of inquiry that costed us 30 million, right, in taxes, like the taxes that we pay, right? So how is it that a commission of inquiry that costed so much money um, included communities, activists, civil society, researchers, the police themselves, produced these 20 recommendations, only for none of them to be taken up, right? So that is where we're standing now. Um, you know, the conversation of abolition in South Africa is not a very popular one, but I fear that we near it every single day because every single day we see a complete lack of political will on the side of policing, not only to not be, you know, violent and horrific, but also to do basic things like, you know, enforce a protection order against uh, an abusive domestic partner. So that, that's the conversation around, you know, policing in South Africa right now, that we, we lack a uh, political will. You know, if you're talking about local law enforcement, you're talking about um, the South African police service, you're talking about the introduction of the South African National Defense Force during this um, corona crisis. We are sitting with a complete lack of political will, political accountability. You know, you mentioned IPED, and IPED is in the civil society sector, IPED is always such a contested topic because you can't fund a police service to police the police. You know, like, they, they reaches a point, and people are really angry with IPED, right? So they'll say that, you know, IPED isn't investigating my case. And then IPED will say, well, no, we take the most prominent cases. Um, when in reality, you need internal accountability. The Minister of Police, the Minister of um, the South African National Defense Force, there is zero internal accountability. You know, there is this culture of impunity, a culture of violence, um, and a culture of like, well, take us to court. If you have a problem, you can take us to court and we'll see you in court, we'll lawyer up and you'll lose. Um, and that, you know, that is the, 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 you know, the eye of the storm that we are sitting in, um, in the South African context. Sure, thank you for that, um, Khadija. Um, so perhaps in closing, I'm just curious as to how um, all of you think uh, working class movements can make sense of this moment and um, 
push um, um, push forward. Um, Claudia? Well, I think it's important for us to, to gain clarity. Sometimes this, you know, one of the things that, that we could learn from history is how in moments of uprisings, the state and the ruling class has um, utilized those moments to advance their agenda. And keying in on how we have played into their game in reacting to, I think it's important for us to think about you know, this revolutionary process towards, you know, systemic transformation as one that happens in stages and think about what's our call at this particular stage. Um, acknowledging that throughout history, there, there have been many revolts and many uprisings. And the key um, has always and should always be for our organizations, our instruments of the working class to come on the other side stronger than they were before. This is a moment of awakening for a lot of people, not only in the United States, but across the world. You know, the, the, the millions of people who have died around the world because of the negligence and the incompetence of neoliberal projects is huge. You know, um, Professor Gordon was talking about the different types of crises. You know, these are crises that were there before and have deepened in this moment. You know, how do we identify the sectors of the working class that are more up in arms and more discontent about this moment and actually organize that discontent in a way that becomes a strategic force, not only nationally, but internationally against the ruling class? I think that that's a, a challenge we have, um, you know, coming out of this crisis. For us in the United States, it's a, it's a key moment because, again, the ruling class will position itself to be the ones to capture and co-opt, you know, um, what comes out of this moment. And so those of us who are doing grassroots organizing that are um, organizing towards the agenda of, of, of the working class in general, and are obviously uh, uh, clear about the use of white supremacy and racism to be able to sustain the system have a huge task to be able to clarify who the friends are and who the enemies are, you know. Um, we, we have to play a role in unifying and articulating the different social movements that have been um, in a lot of ways uh, weakened uh, over decades, right? This idea that folks need to be um, fighting in, is in isolated spaces and silos, you know, that um, the immigrants should fight for their, for their reforms, that the LGBTQ community needs to fight for its reform, that women need to fight for their reforms. Like we need to um, get to a space where we understand that it's not about the reforms because the reforms will be made to serve the state ultimately and, and to serve their agenda. We need to find ways of deconstructing and creating a new. And so, you know, just in general, we have the huge challenge of, of organizing, of agitating, of mobilizing and transforming ultimately what needs to be transformed in our society. Sure, and some of your concluding thoughts, Khadija? Um, so just on what Claudia said, um, I think it's really important, you know, um, to think about as grassroots organizations, how we position ourselves. Um, and given the work that we do and the important strides that we make in comparison to how the media specifically depicts us. So with policing in South Africa, um, there is, there is a, um, an ongoing process within communities to find alternative ways of, or different ways of imagining justice for ourselves that is removed from policing. And when we do so, it is, um, it is, you know, demonized as vigilantism or it's demonized as anti-rule of law. Um, and so here, the question of, of, of the media and, and policing and, and us, you know, trying to find ways of justice without the police, given its um, anti-justice, uh, you know, agenda. Um, I think it's really important then that in the South African context, we count the narrative these stereotypes and ideals of um, 
of people not wanting or the larger society not wanting to reimagine what justice will look like without the police. And I think that's really, really important for us um, going forward. Sure. Thank you so much. And finally, um, Professor Gordon. I have two um, currents of thought on your question. The first one goes uh, directly to what we've been talking about in terms of the police. A lot of people don't realize that the police did not always, weren't always here. It's fun. It, it reminds me of when we watch these movies about uh, ancient times and people had zippers and, you know, doorknobs and things like that. The police were very recent. And the police were created over the past um, 150 years uh, with two fundamental objectives. In Europe, their objective was to block the capacity of people to gather to push the causes of their interest. To put bluntly, they were actually created to fight against the working class. They really were. So the, in, in the European context, it was fundamentally against democracy. Now, in the U.S. and all the colonies, that fight against democracy inevitably took a form of being against, it took a racialized form. It took a form of being against indigenous peoples, black peoples, and you could see in the African context, both converge, okay? Now, once we begin to understand that, this meant that within those places, the very idea was to block the access of such peoples to democracy itself. But deep down, it's because already, if you look at the European context, their purpose was against democracy. So this brings us to the question of what is involved in a struggle for dignity, freedom, meaning, and flourishing. And here we begin to, we can look at it concretely in our, look at the four of us right here. Because the four of us right here are descendants of people who are marked for extinction. The descendants, we are all living proof that when our ancestors fought the good fight, they were succeeding, although they may have died believing they failed. And this should be the message to us. There is no such thing as a failed insurrection premised upon dignity, freedom, and a struggle for human and life flourishing. How did these people act? Everything told them they would fail. Everything. There were, there were global navies. There were all kinds of, there were soldiers, all kinds of mechanisms. There were limitations of, of, of mobility, all of that. And I'm not just talking, and, 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 and I hope people are listening. Don't think about the warriors and I'm talking about as males. The fact of the matter is the women, the communities who transcended the idea of the binaries of male and female, all of those communities fought in a world that said they did not have the right to exist. But we are in a position to continue that struggle because had they not waged their part of the struggle, we wouldn't be here. So those people in the streets right now, all of us in our many, our many efforts, our many contributions, all the struggle requires is for us to do our part. The ramifications of our part is not for us to know, are not for us to know. What, for us, what it is for us to know is the commitment we have to this struggle. And so everybody, from the person in the most, the most remote rural region, all the way to those of us who are right now able to communicate with each other through these technologies, what we need to understand is our connectedness in the struggle and our commitment to it. And so I have, no, and this is not about optimism or pessimism. This is about just doing what needs to be done. And so we join, we need to understand to join our, for instance, Mozambican predecessors as we shout the words, Aluta Continua. The fight continues. Thank you, 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to the three of you for a really important um, and useful and constructive conversation. Um, thank you to everyone else who is watching this conversation. Um, we look forward to having more conversations with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us.